Okay, everybody. Um, once again, welcome to our FRCS mentor session. Um, we are uh, looking forward to a uh, really good talk on shoulder instability by Mustafa Rashid. He's one of the shoulder fellows in Wrightington. I know every time I hear one of his talks, uh, the talk just becomes that bit more easier and understandable. Um, he, uh, so without too much delay, we'll uh, introduce uh, Mustafa Rashid. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone, for giving up their evening to listen to me. Hopefully, um, this topic, which actually does come up uh, quite regularly in the uh, in the exam, and I'll explain the cases which it comes up in. Um, uh, and it also came up in my eBot exam, but this this topic in particular, I'm not going to talk too much about it. But there is, um, at the time at the end, I can talk to you about my experience of what I got in terms of cases for shoulders built in the FRCS and how that differed to the case that I got in the eBot. And it, it couldn't have been further apart. It really highlights the differences between those two postgraduate uh, exams. Um, so let's see if this works. So, okay. So um, the objectives uh, today, we're gonna to outline the mechanism of shoulder instability. And we're gonna recap the associated pathologies um, and discuss management strategies, surgical and conservative, um, uh, for treating patients with an unstable shoulder. I'm going to give you three example cases um, that could easily have come up in the FRCS. And then when there's an opportunity, like with all the FRCS mentor sessions, to um, do some bio practice at the end. Uh, so all of these... Uh, uh, athletes um, are experiencing a shoulder instability and there's lots of different mechanisms. So um, quite a common mechanism is a fall onto a uh, forward flex and um, an abducted arm. You could also fall as the Aussie rules football player on the bottom right, although it is struggling to cycle, uh, land um, directly onto the elbow um, that's extended. And so there's a, an anterior um, and a superior directed force on the proximal humerus. And there's a couple of uh, um, there's a couple of uh, examples there of patients that clearly have already an unstable shoulder, and they do very minimal amount of exertion, and it really is a, a muscle contracture event suddenly that is pulling their shoulder out. And, and you can hypothesize that in those patients, they probably had a, a more significant traumatic event previously, um, and was never fully stable before it came out again. So, so there is a variety of, um, of, of ways in which you can dislocate your shoulder, but quite commonly it's a, it's a fall, there's a, an element of external rotation, abduction, um, uh, most commonly. So if you get um, the scenario where you're basically presented with um, an acute uh, traumatic event and shoulder pain, um, you really got to just focus on the assessment and you've got to be quite quick with um, progressing through this. You don't really want to get bogged down with what you're going to do in the emergency department because this is basically what you do as an ST3. You know, it's not really FRCS level. So you want to get through, you want to confirm the dislocation and that's with clinical and radiographic confirmation. Uh, you want to assess for neurological and vascular uh, compromise. Um, and that um, is, is really key. That's the kind of a pass-fail thing if you don't um, assess uh, the distal neuro neurology as well as the um, external the nerve um, and always check for a pulse you'd be surprised actually in some of the older patients that have a dislocation how often they get a slightly thready pulse um, that that often isn't picked up by your junior so um, assess that um, attempt to save reduction which is often uh, in the emergency department and the confirm the reduction clinically and radiographically and repeat the neurological and vascular assessment. Nothing too complicated about that. It's what we do every week when we're on call and we get a similar case. With regards to the radiographs, people often get really confused. Just keep it very simple, you know, just say what you see. Um, if you're not sure, if they give you just one view, just, just take your time, say what you see. If you're unsure, head your bets and say, I'd like some more x-rays and more imaging, please. If they give you two orthogonal views on the x-ray, just say, I, I, I'm really sorry. I, I suspect there may be instability here, but I would, I'm not 100% sure. So in my clinical practice, I would confirm this uh, with a CT scan. Um, and and that's, a, that's a safe thing to do, okay? Unless it's bond or obvious, a lot of the time it's, it's not. And 
if you're struggling, you can say, you know, one step more than that is you can say, well, the patient obviously is, is having difficulty getting in the right position to get um, adequate x-rays, radiographs. I would um, ask the radiographer if they're able to do a modified axial view or a Velpu view, which um, can often reveal um, that it's that not sitting in the glenohumeral humeral joint. Um, nearly all patients will need a repeat x-ray after you manipulate their shoulder. Um, and most patients will require some sort of cross-sectional imaging uh, in the clinic after they've been um, after they've been treated for their acute event. So you you may get X-rays like this. Uh, again, these are pretty pretty obvious. You know that uh, it's a dislocation. And just remember, the commonest direction is anterior inferior. You know, ninety five to ninety seven percent of uh, shoulder instability goes in the anterior inferior direction. Okay. Um, and so that's basically what you're looking for. If you're not sure it's, and you, you're, not, you're not that familiar with seeing these, um, if you're gonna guess, it's gonna be anterior inferior, okay? But you can see on the left-hand view how the, um, the posterior humeral head is sat directly perched onto the anterior glenoid rim. And so, you, you know, you can imagine there's uh, normally some interposing tissue there. There's a labrum, there's, there's capsule, things like that. And so you can see how in the dislocation, you've got a, uh, you know, a huge amount of capsular uh, plastic deformation for the head to be in that position. Um, B, the uh, labrum has to have taken some sort of injury, whether it's a, um, an avulsion or a, um, or a sort of compression event, something has got to have happened to the labrum for the bones to be touching like that. And, and then look at the bones, you know, the bones will have an impact. And in particular on the humeral head, that is uh, literally an impaction fracture that you're seeing there. You know, the humeral head in that view tends to be reasonably spherical and it's clearly not. It's hourglass shaped now due to the impaction of the uh, uh, humeral head on the glenoid rim. So uh, you may get something like this. Um, this is not the same patient, although the x-rays do line up quite nicely. Uh, these are different patients, but um, th this is a fracture dislocation. And people often get really worried about whether you should be reducing this um, in the emergency department or not. Um, the, the safest bet is to say not, you know, just to say that in your experience, this needs uh, adequate muscle relaxation um, with an intubated patient to avoid the risk of uh, propagating the fracture across the anatomical neck. Um, and so that would be a reasonably safe FRCS answer. They will often push you in that scenario to say, well, you know, um, theatres have just started a 12 hour laparotomy. There's nothing, no one available. In which case you can and then escalate, discuss with your emergency physician colleagues and see if they have the expertise and, and ability to perform um, procedural sedation uh, safely in the recess. Uh, and if they can't, then it's not unreasonable to say, I'll be picking up the phone to my local uh, trauma center because of the unusual circumstances that I find myself in uh, without capacity to be able to do this safely. I mean, that, yeah, you could say that, but you try, try and diffuse the situation and just make it abundantly clear that um, what you're trying to do is uh, get this reduced because it's an emergency without causing further, further harm. But in reality, you know, these patients with this kind of fracture dislocation, unless they're <clears throat> reasonably old and frail or unless the grace tuberosity sits exactly where it should be, a lot of the time this will require some sort of surgical intervention uh, anyway. So um, bear that in mind. You may get uh, x-rays like this. Um, at first glance, this may be quite difficult to interpret, but let's just go through one by one. So on the far left, um, the proximal humerus on an AP projection is not meant to be perfectly spherical, okay? There's uh, eccentricity to the humeral head in relation to the uh, anatomical axis of the humerus, okay? And so if you're seeing a humeral head that sits perfectly in line with the humeral shaft, and if you were to draw a line straight down the humeral shaft, I'm not sure whether you can see my cursor, if you go straight down here and 50% of the head is on either side, this is a posterior dislocation until proven otherwise, okay? This is the infamous light bulb sign because the humeral head looks like a light bulb and it's not meant to. Um, this is also something similar, okay? There's something not quite right here, okay? 
you can't quite make out where the glenohumeral joint is. There's significant overlap. And there's also some sclerosis within the head, right? Um, so this is also a similar sign. This is the trough sign. And this is the um, uh, loss of half moon overlap sign. And then finally, the modified axial tells you the story here. Um, this is the glenoid here, relatively flat socket. This is the humeral shaft. This is the humeral head. And we can see, you can, as you trace the glenoid, is the uh, anterior, uh, sorry, posterior glenoid neck. And the humeral head is sat within it. And in fact, it's compressed. About, about a quarter of the humeral head is, is missing here. And that's because of a significant impaction fracture to the posterior glenoid rim. So all in all, all of these radiographs, they're of different patients, but they all describe um, uh, posterior dislocation, which is, um, I, I, would, I would put it in the category of, of a classic FRCS um, fiber scenario, trauma fiber scenario, uh, because they can take it a lot of different ways. They can write the same uh, branch question with the same radiographs and take it, you know, five or six different routes. So it's a really high yield question that comes up in part two. You often get a starter like this after you've identified what it is, they'll say, what are the signs of the posterior shoulder dislocation? And most people get really bogged down with the radiographic signs. They remember light bulb sign and they go, a light bulb sign. And then the examiner goes, what are the other ones? And then there's just blank. So, you know, be systematic, like I've talked about in my previous talks. Um, the signs are clinical and radiographic. The clinical signs are loss of external, uh, passive external rotation. The radiographic signs include the light bulb sign, the trough line sign, which is basically a reverse hill sac lesion, it's an impaction fracture. So it looks like a, a stripe of uh, sclerosis within the medial uh, humeral head. There's the loss of normal half moon overlap. And then there's the rim sign, which um, uh, wasn't really uh, visible on those x rays prior. But the rim sign is essentially a vacant. Uh, glenoid fossa. So it looks like a widening and, and the definition in some radiology tech, um, textbooks, I believe is more than six millimeters, but um, it, it just looks abnormal. So just, just have a, a low index of suspicion. If you're shown an x-ray um, of someone in, 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 in the history is some sort of traumatic, minor traumatic event, and now they're struggling with pain um, or uh, loss of external rotation, just think, could this be a missed posterior dislocation? And then loss of external rotation is the clinical, the main clinical sign, really. Uh, you often will get asked about nerve injuries. You know, you may say, oh, well, I would, I would um, evaluate the uh, distal neurology, median, all the radial nerves, as well as the proximal neurology, the auxiliary nerve, to look for any signs of um, uh, deficit. And then you may get asked, well, what is the commonest? A nerve injury you would expect with a dislocation. And the answer here, based on this paper from Holland, is, is the auxiliary nerve. It's most commonly affected. And what they actually found, which is really quite interesting, is the, the rate of uh, neu neurological injury with a dislocation episode is uh, strongly correlated to the age of the patient. So the older we are, uh, the more likely it is that you'll have a nerve injury. And they actually did a study where they gave everyone an EMG uh, to quantify this, and they found nearly half had some degree of axonal loss, the vast majority of which will recover spontaneously with observation, but you've really got to be aware of it. And um, I've seen quite a few patients in their 70s who've got an um, infraclavicular brachial plexus, a dense brachial plexus palsy that's taken a very long time to show signs of improvement. Um, in the clinic, it's a different scenario, okay? It's your, you know, you're in the fracture clinic or the elective shoulder clinic and you're presented with a case. Keep it very simple. Take a history. What's the mechanism? Is it their first time dislocation? Um, do they have pain currently? Are they a hypermobile patient? When they had their dislocation recently, did they need a reduction? That's really quite important. Shoulder surgeons really obsess about this because the patients come in and go, and you ask them, how many times have you just had? Oh, 17 times. And you're like, okay. And you look at their PACS record. They've never been to any other hospital and they've only got three x-rays. So there's something not quite right. They're probably having instability episodes, but they may not be having frank dislocation episodes that 
require sedation and um, clinical input to reduce it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not relevant that they're having these several episodes. It just means that either they're so unstable, the patient has learned how to reduce it spontaneously, or more likely they're perching and coming back to the center of the glenoid fossa. Um, so that's quite important. With your examination, again, look, feel, move, special test. The same thing that we learned when we were um, uh, junior registrars. In special tests, don't forget uh, apprehension. I always do my apprehension supine. You can do it standing up, but supine is usually preferred. Uh, and remember, there's a, a few little uh, tricks for this, but you've just got to instill confidence in the patient and take it very slow. So what I often tell the patient, I get them to lie down. I ask them to bring their arm out to the side, right, with the arm internally rotated. So like this, imagine they're lying down. I then put my elbow, uh, sorry, my hand behind their elbow. And I ask them, imagine my hand is like a coffee table. Rest your arm, rest your elbow onto my hand. And then I, I say to them, let gravity bring your hand down. Okay, so I'm letting, I'm letting them relax and allowing um, passive external rotation with the assistance of gravity. And once you get to around 70 degrees external rotation plus, you'll find the patient feels uncomfortable. And they'll never tell you, I feel like it's getting this Some patients do, but often I'll say to them, does that feel weird? Does that feel uncomfortable? Does that feel like um, it's not sitting in the joint properly? Does it feel like it might come out? And they often say yes. In which case you then apply a posteriorly directed force to the proximal humerus and you keep it there. And you say to the patient, does that get rid of that uncomfortable sensation? And if they say yes, that's apprehension positive and Joe's relocation test positive. And often you can do a rebound test. So you let go of that posterior directed force and they will get apprehensive again. Okay, but that's a bit mean. But I would say that the key one for me is when I recenter the humeral head in abduction and external rotation, I push backwards and I recenter the humeral head. It then relieves that proprioceptive stretch on the anterior uh, inferior capsule and they feel like that's where their, their humeral head is meant to sit. And so that apprehension sensation goes away. And that is really quite a sensitive sign. Um, in older patients, always uh, um, assess cuff integrity. Uh, so resisted abduction, internal rotation, resisted external rotation, and some subscap test, whichever you like. And again, uh, always talk about neurovascular status. But don't talk about, talk about it like that. Split it up into median, ulnar, radial, and axillary nerves. When it comes to your imaging in the clinic, Start with radiographs. Um, there are some special views you can get to identify a hill sacs lesion um, uh, and a glenoid rim uh, fracture. Don't worry too much about that. Just ask for, at the very least, um, an AP and an axial. And then there is some debate about what form of cross-sectional imaging you get. Um, in, in common practice, it's a MRI. In some centers, it's an MR arthrogram. And the radiologists debate about this quite a bit. I mean, the, the literature is, is actually quite clear. An MR arthrogram is more sensitive to picking up capsule labral uh, injuries. Um, but often there's logistical issues with getting those in, in numbers. Um, there's limitations in MSK radiologists who are able to do the arthrogram. You know, that takes time. Um, and availability is the biggest issue. And some people now argue if you have a three Tesla plain MR, it's just as good, which is probably true. Um, but, you know, the gold standard is an MR arthrogram. The examiner may ask you, well, if they had an acute injury and you have access to a, a scan within a week or two, do you need the arthrogram? And what they're basically getting at is for you to understand that the hematoma caused by the injury acts like a contrast. Um, and a plain MR may actually be sensitive enough to pick that up. Ultrasound scan is probably the mainstay for the uh, over 40 year old patient with an instability episode because it's the most easily accessible uh, way of assessing the integrity of the rotator cuff. And most shoulder surgeons believe that an acute traumatic rotator cuff tear um, picked up early should be treated early with an operation. And um, that has been challenged by a Swedish study uh, relatively recently but that's still the prevailing uh, sentiment within the shoulder community. So if you get a person over the age of 40 who's had a dislocation episode, get an urgent ultrasound. If there's a full fitness rotator cuff tear, get them into theater 
And in some places, they even go onto the trauma list for the shoulder surgeons to do an acute cuff repair. But in most places, they probably get listed as a P2, um, you know, semi-elective acute case on the elective shoulder list. In some places, they get a CT or a CT arthrogram. I went to one place where that was their mainstay investigation. Uh, it's very common in, in, the con in continental Europe, in France in particular. And I can see the logic for this as well. I think it probably it might be my preference as well as a consultant, because if you have a young person with a traumatic anterior dislocation, you almost certainly can bank on the fact that they'll have some sort of anterior inferior capsular labral injury of some variety. And in reality, if they're going to proceed to require surgical stabilization, you will see that with arthroscopy. One thing that does change your decision-making process is if they've got bone loss. And people argue you know, to death about how accurate an MRI is versus a CT scan, but CT scan still remains the gold standard for assessing bone loss. And so if you were to have one cross-sectional imaging investigation that will profoundly determine how you manage the patient, I would argue that a CT is probably it because that's the most accurate way of determining whether there's bone loss and bone loss is what really determines whether the patient will have a soft tissue procedure or not. So just something to think about. The safe answer is an MR arthrogram if available, a plain MR if the consultant radiologist feel that that is appropriately accurate to pick up um, capture labor or pathology. That's, that's the safe answer. Um, also in the clinic, just be wary of this, right? So if you have a look very carefully, this is a young man who's had an instability episode and he's got some ab abnormal uh, scapular movements here. He's getting early protraction and um, some flexion, a prominent inframedial angle of his scapula. This is very common. And a lot of this can be rehabilitated, but patients often won't tell you, oh, it feels weird on my scapula. They'll just say my shoulder hurts so it's easier because you've lost the normal proprioceptive pathways of which the um, anterior inferior capsule labral junction provides a significant contribution to. So I think my wife, I might have cut out there, so I'll just repeat that. If you see some sort of um, scapular asymmetry on clinical examination in someone who's had a relatively recent instability episode, um, that is probably the fact that they've got a capsular labral injury and loss of the normal proprioceptive mechanisms to ensure that they know where their scapula is positioned in relation to the glenohumeral joint. And so this is quite a common thing that often will rehabilitate back to normal, um, but often won't. And so you've got to look for it as well. Uh, no talk on shoulder disability is complete without mentioning Arthur Bankart. He was a London-based surgeon in the um, 20s to 50s. Uh, he's a bit of a legend, really, in shoulder surgery. And, and he was really quite annoyed at, at his time in the 20s and 30s when there were over 100 operations described for doing various things to the shoulder to stabilize it. And his, his view was that everyone was just not seeing the lesion. They were not seeing the pathology. And so he advocated taking down the coracoid, which no one really does nowadays, but taking down the coracoid to fully expose the anterior inferior labrum and the capsule and the glenoid rim. And then he says, you will find the essential lesion is what he described, which is this anterior inferior capsular labral avulsion um, from the glenoid. And he actually called it, you know, the, um, he called it the glenoid ligament. And he actually thought the labrum often didn't heal very often. So he would excise the labrum and attach the capsule using dental drills and cat gut sutures directly onto the glenoid face. Uh, and that was his uh, technique. Then he would wire the coracoid process back on. Um, but, but the Bankart lesion is an anterior inferior uh, labral detachment. Um, the thing to say about the labrum, uh, this is an important point, is the labrum is dense in proprioceptive nerve fibers. It also really is a conduit for the capsule in the inferior glenohumeral um, ligament to attach to the glenoid bone. And that's really what the labrum does. Um, and so if it's detached, you know, it's not really a bumper. Look, look at how flat the glenoid fossa is and look at how much it's deepened by the labrum. This is not enough to stop this giant humeral head from dislocating, right? So it's not really a bumper. Okay? That, that's just rubbish. It looks like a bumper, but in reality, that's not how it functions. It's predominantly a, um, 
proprioceptive um, structure. And so it allows your brain to know where the center of the glenoid fossa is in all positions of putting your arm in space, okay? And it also allows the static check reins of the um, capsule in the inferior glenohumeral ligament in particular um, to, to, to attach to the glenoid and, and be functional. There are a number of other associated pathologies, some of which are described here. This is a very famous Google image. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where it comes from. I've seen this in so many slides. And then uh, the uh, MRI slice sequence, the coronal scan that we see there is um, uh, demonstrating a, a Hagel lesion, which is a, um, a glenohumeral ligament avulsion from the humerus. So not from the glenoid, but from the humeral side. Um, my advice to you about the associated pathology, if you get asked a question about this, is just keep it simple, okay? So just think, okay, the Bankart lesion is the essential lesion. So that's the thing that you're most likely going to have in a traumatic anterior uh, shoulder dislocation. Or you may have that plus some bone, which would make it a bony Bankart. Or some periosteum, which could be a Perthes lesion, and if it's stuck down medially, an Alps lesion. Um, or cartilage, which is a GLAD lesion. Okay. It doesn't really matter what they're called. Just don't get too bogged down with that. But each of these um, is a slight variation on the theme. Okay, It's an anterior inferior glenoid uh, rim plus capsule plus um, bone issue. And then the capsule itself can have a detachment, as we've said, either from the glenoid, which um, by definition is what a bank art lesion is. It's the capsule attaching to the labrum, which is no longer attached to the glenoid rim. Or... Uh, more commonly, it's often missed, is a detachment from the humerus. If you ever see a Hagel lesion, these patients are profoundly unstable in clinic. They really don't, you know, there's the, their shoulder's totally floppy. It sits within a very capacious, uh, voluminous bag now within the capsule because there's nothing really attached. <clears throat> and so um, be aware of those patients. They often will be apprehensive even at low levels of abduction. Um, you may get shown a radiograph like this and, and they'll say, you know, what do you think? Um, and you can say that the glenohumeral joint is end located here, um, but we can see a significant impaction compression fracture of the posterior humeral head in keeping with a hill sacs lesion. So hill sacs, two people, both radiologists, both American, um, Harold Hill and Maurice Sachs. They actually didn't describe the lesion. They just popularized it. It was described many years earlier by someone called Eve, um, uh, soon after the um, discovery of uh, uh, x-rays by William Rundigen, who I think was, had his anniversary of the discovery not so long ago, actually, maybe last week. Um, but they really popularized it and said, you know, look, we should be looking for this. They, they were both radiologists. Um, then um, various surgeons came along in the noughties and described this concept of the engaging hill sac lesion, which came and went very quickly, actually, once people realized that every hill sac lesion engaged at some point in its lifetime, right? But what they were really talking about, and this is really Steve Burkhardt's work from San Antonio, Texas, is he described at the time of arthroscopy, bringing the arm up into abduction external rotation to see if he could get the uh, impaction divot fracture of the hill sac lesion to actually perch onto the glenoid rim. Uh, and this is what that looks like. You can see this is a you know, quite a bad shoulder. This, the thing that you're looking at on the right is the humeral head. Um, let me just see if I can play this again. And you can see that's a very large and very wide hill sac lesion. Uh, and you can see how as the uh, arm gets externally rotated, this can quite easily engage onto the anterior glenoid rim. Bony bank art we talked about. Uh, these are most commonly will require surgery. You know, think of it as an articular fracture. You know, they should be treated as such. Um, when these are missed, it's often quite difficult. I mean, it's, it, you know, the patient has a miserable time. They go down the elective pathway, which, are, you know, in the current climate of COVID in the NHS is often taking months to get to a, a surgical definitive resolution. And so this is, you know, very unstable, especially if it's displaced especially with a significant portion of the uh, glenoid rim. Um, and so this is not a very pleasant thing to have to live with and go back to work with whilst you're waiting your elective operation. Um, they often need a CT to best, better assess them. A lot of the time we pick these up late 
the fragment is displaced medially on, and is stuck down to the glenoid neck. And that's quite a shame. And if that's a significant portion of the glenoid rim, then really uh, any soft tissue procedure, any acute surgery to try and uh, heal the fracture in the correct position is, is, is lost then at that point. And so then you have to do something to replace the bone that's lost. We briefly talked about what imaging, there was a nice paper that looked at this. Lots of different studies have looked at it, lots of narrative reviews, but essentially the consensus is thought to be that three Tesla scanners are better than the 1.5 Tesla scanners for picking up capture labral pathology. Um, in North America, it's, it's very popular to do this ABA position, this abduction and sterile rotation position in the scanner, um, which is thought to be quite beneficial for improving the sensitivity of the imaging. We do it in variable uh, amounts in this country, I would say, in the places I've worked. They um, concluded that uh, MR arthrogram is, is much, you know, is 90, 96 versus 93% better for picking up labral lesions. Um, but in terms of detached labral fragments, it was highly, um, significantly more sensitive. And that's purely because you've got the contrast going around that fragment uh, on the arthrogram, which you don't have in the plain MR. Uh, and then, uh, the important thing to know is that you can miss lesions with an MR arthrogram. It's not infallible, but it is it is slightly more sensitive, even though it can be quite challenging to organize that in your, in your NHS setup. So try and think of the associated injuries a bit like a ladder of ascending things that make you more and more unstable and more likely to push you towards um, uh, surgical intervention. So you've got your bank heart lesion, which everyone pretty much gets. Uh, you've got your hill sacs lesion, which again, most people get, but in varying of degrees, you know, you can get large hill sacs lesions, you get small hill sac lesions. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. You can get your Alps lesions, your GLAD lesions, your Perthane lesions, all these other extensive periosteal sleeve avulsions or cartilage plus periosteal sleeve avulsions that you get. They will make you generally more unstable. A bony bank heart, by definition, you've got, you've lost bone from a, an area of the body that is notoriously for not being a large socket, large bit of bone, and that makes you significantly more unstable. And then, you know, as we talked about earlier, the top thing is if you have the bony bank heart, a large capsular avulsion from the humeral side and the hill sacs lesion, you know, that patient is going to be profoundly unstable. So think of it like a ladder of ascending associated pathologies. You may get asked about how you classify instability. Um, lots of different ways to, to, to do this. In the UK, I guess the standard, because it came from you know, Ian Bailey and the Stanmore group uh, many years ago now, is probably the Stanmore Triangle. You should probably know about this for the exam. Um, essentially, the Stanmore Triangle is three polar types, and you need to appreciate that patients don't have to sit on the uh, corners of this triangle. They often rarely do, actually. They'll have contributions from all three polar types. And the important thing to note is that there are temporal changes and patients can move within the triangle depending on their rehab, the time since injury, et cetera. And so now, you know, um, uh, Andrew Jaggi, who's the senior physiotherapy consultant at Stanmore, talks about the Stanmore prism um, as the patient moves through the, within that triangle through, um, through time. But generally speaking, you're, you know, acute, young, um, you know, recreational sporting uh, traumatic anterior instability is likely to be most commonly a polar type one uh, injury. Um, but you need to be aware that there are polar type two injuries. And these are patients that are hypermobile that may have a traumatic event, but often don't. Um, or the trauma is very minor, not really significant enough to warrant um, association with possible um, uh, labral injury. They often won't have a hill sacs lesion on the x-ray. That's a big giveaway for these patients. You do an MRI, you might see some chronic changes in the labrum. It doesn't look detached, but there's no hill sacs lesion. And that's because they're so hypermobile. They don't, there's never enough um, constriction within the soft tissues for that impaction fracture to occur as they, as they sublux or dislocate. Um, and then you get the type threes, which a lot of us have come across in, in on calls in A&E. Um, they tend to be quite young. They tend to have a, a variety of, of issues. They come in very regularly um, to the emergency department um, with a dislocated shoulder. Uh, and these are um, a complex group of patients to treat. 
and they almost certainly do not require an operation. Um, same with the Polar Type 2s, they rarely need an operation unless there is a significant traumatic event that creates um, a structural lesion in someone who was previously quite hypermobile. And even then it can be very difficult to treat them surgically. The vast majority and mainstay of treatment for type twos and threes is physiotherapy. Um, type one is, is often surgery, but we'll come on to that. <clears throat> you may get asked about risk of recurrence and you really do need to know this paper. One of the many landmark papers by Mike Robinson in Edinburgh, I mean, his work is, is truly quite amazing. And this is a, a good example of that. Um, this is a study looking at the two-year recurrence rate following a first-time uh, shoulder dislocation. And what he basically found, he kind of built on the work of a chap called Leonard Hevelius, who worked in like Mayo in Sweden, which is really northern Sweden, Arctic Circle, uh, who wrote a, a bunch of papers in the 90s and early noughties, uh, looking at long-term follow-up of um, shoulder dislocations. And what he basically found was your lifetime risk of recurrence is directly linked to the age of first dislocation. And uh, Mike Robinson did this uh, in a very elegant way in Edinburgh, where he looked at the two-year recurrence rate and found the same thing. And he gave us these nice um, uh, um, uh, relative risk ratios <coughs> of recurrence after first dislocation based on age. But he also demonstrated that if you were male, that was also a significant risk factor for recurrence. So you can see that you know the 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 uh, two-year recurrence rate is actually significantly different between male, men and women. Um, and so this is quite a useful thing to to um, think about. The way I try and tend to remember it is at the age of 27, you've got a 50% chance as a bloke to, um, to have a, another dislocation if we did nothing um, within two years. And similarly, if, if you are very young uh, and female, 16, 17, 50% risk. That's one way to remember it. Um, the, the other way I remember it is if you're under 20, you've got an over 75% chance of having a two-year recurrence um, if your dislocation was at that age. So you need to know this. That's, that's quite key for the RCFs. Um, don't worry too much about this, but people have tried to quantify your risk of failure following an arthroscopic bank card repair. Uh, and this uh, um, group in, uh, in Nice, Pascal Boileau, a very famous shoulder surgeon, who described the ISIS score uh, before ISIS, the other group. And um, he basically said, you know, if you've got more than six points that correlated to a 70% recurrence risk at a mean of 31 months. But this kind of study based on retrospective data um, is, is probably not the, the thing that you really want to be quoting for your to hang your hat on in terms of decision making. But what it did do is kind of quantify to some degree the risk factors for recurrence following a soft tissue procedure. So you can see them here on the left. If you're very young, if you're playing competitive sport, if you're playing contact sport, um, if you're hyperlax, if you've got a large heel sac lesion, and if you've lost some bone on the glenoid side, these are all risk factors that he thought um, uh, increase your risk of failure with a bank heart repair. And interestingly now, Pascal Wallo has very famously said that um, all of his patients, regardless of amount of bone loss, will get an arthroscopic latigé procedure. So he didn't do any bank heart surgery, um, which is definitely not a view that you want to um, trot out in the FRCS because that's not the common UK practice uh, currently. Um, this is a video of uh, a surgeon that I went to visit in uh, Colorado called Peter Millet doing a bank heart repair. I'm just going to let this run. I won't let this run all the way through, but it's really nice for those that haven't seen much um, arthroscopic shoulder surgery to understand what's going on here. So we're viewing from the posterior portal. Um, this is the left shoulder. This is the probe coming in and you can see it, the probe just falls down in between the labrum and the glenoid rim. You can see this is quite an acute scenario. This is in America where you can see a lot of uh, hemorrhage. So this patient would have dislocated not so long ago. And you can see there's quite a capacious inferior recess. The IGHL is detensioned. That inferior sling is, is not tight at all. Um, and what you'll see here, he'll, he'll debride some of the frayed tissue and start to mobilize the labrum. As you can see here, he's going to bring in, <clears throat> oh, he's going to show you the hill sacs lesion there very quickly. We'll come back to that in a moment. 
He's testing the superior label to see if there's any extension superiorly of this uh, label detachment. Here's the Hill Sachs lesion again. This is quite a deep but narrow Hill Sachs lesion. Um, and so he's debriding some of the frayed labral tissue here with a soft tissue shaver. And then he's using a periosteal elevator arthroscopically to really elevate the uh, labrum and the attached capsule to it. He then is making his, um, his anterior uh, portal. And using a hook probe here to release the uh, tissue from further. This is often quite, quite a useful step because then you can see how mobile now the labor of the capsule is to be able to uh, retension it onto the glenoid rim. And then he's basically going to prepare the glenoid, uh, pass some anchors and, and re retention the uh, glenoid rim. I'm just going to see if I can show you the final construct of what this looks like. So you can see here, You can see here that the, the bumper, if you like, has been re reconstituted. That's not really what's important. The important thing is you've reattached the capsule via the labrum onto the glenoid rim. So now, once that's healed, you've restored your proprioceptive feedback mechanism so that you now know where the anterior glenoid rim is so you can keep the head centered using your important dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder. Okay. There is a Cochrane review on this topic. It basically concluded that um, primary surgery in young men um, with high demanding sporting and physical activities after the fertilization is, is, is um, probably warranted, but there's no evidence of which type of surgery is the best. And that's probably fair to say. It's important for you to mention this in the FRCS. This is the best guidelines. Uh, there's, there's a few pathways. There's uh, one for traumatic anterior. There's one for atraumatic. Um, and I think there's one for multidirectional instability, which we're not going to talk about. Um, but they came out with this suggested algorithm for treatment. If you're under 25, um, you should be referred to a shoulder specialist in secondary care. You should be allowed to mobilize as soon as the pain allows. You should be assessed by a shoulder surgeon within six weeks and have um, some imaging and consideration of arthroscopic anatomic repair. If you're 25 to 40, um, you should be reassessed at three to six months in the shoulder clinic. And if you remain symptomatic, have the same uh, diagnostic imaging and treatment. If you're over 40, you should be assessed early in terms of diagnostic imaging and shoulder, shoulder specialist and have an early rotator cuff repair if clinically relevant. That's not always the case. You know, if you're 90 years old and dislocate, the chance of you having a um, cuff, cuff tear before you dislocate it is incredibly high. And so you're not going to start repairing all those 90 year olds cuff tears. But if you're, you know, 45 previously normal shoulder and dislocate, you've got a full thickness cuff lesion, then they advocate you should probably be repairing those early. So you can always fall back on the best guidelines. They're not particularly well evidence based because there isn't a great evidence base for this. But that's what UK practice tends to be um, in this country. Um, you won't get asked about this, I don't think, but if you get a Hill Sachs lesion um, at the time of a bank cart repair, some surgeons advocate doing something called a remplissage, which is a French word that means to fill in. And you're filling in the defect by putting the capsule and the infraspinatus tendon into that defect <coughs> and, and filling it in so that as the patient externally rotates and abducts, this defect is now filled with soft tissue and cannot engage onto the glenoid rim. That's a remplissage. Some surgeons like it, a lot of surgeons don't use it. You do need to know about Latage. A Latage is a, essentially a coracoid transfer operation for, in this country, predominantly um, glenoid bone loss. Okay. And so you basically take the coracoid um, with the conjoint tendon attached to it off. You make a split into the subscapularis and you attach it usually with two screws um, into the into the glenoid, okay? And you basically, when you've got a flattened anterior glenoid surface and you've lost bone, the, the, the glenoid is meant to be pear-shaped. If it's not pear-shaped, um, you haven't got much of a socket for your head to stay on. 
and therefore you're widening the socket and you're increasing the distance required to jump uh, the bone to dislocate. That's the primary, that's one mechanism for keeping this and making it stable. The other mechanism is, as you can imagine, as you abduct and externally rotate your arm, uh, the conjoint tendon then creates an inferior sling or hammock and adding a dynamic soft tissue constraint to dislocation. Um, and so those are the two uh, primary uh, mechanisms for a latigen. And if you're really getting on to an eight, you may be asked to talk about the variations of a latigé. So this is the traditional latigé. This is what's called the congruent art technique developed by Joe De Beer and Steve Burkhart in 2004. And they basically just rotated the coracoid 90 degrees and um, fired the screw through the thin axis of the coracoid, which is a little bit more unforgiving. It's about four millimeters versus seven millimeters. But the benefit of this is the angle perfectly matches the curvature of the glenoid fossa, and it also increases your, um, your graph width. So that's called a congruent art technique. The surgeon that I work for, Ryderton, uh, Professor Len Funk, this is his preferred technique. Uh, and he treats a lot of professional uh, rugby players um, with latigés using this technique. So it is very effective and powerful. Um, the alternative is a bone block procedure where you're taking either iliac crest, distal clavicle, or allograft, and you're bolting it onto the front of the glenoid to reconstitute the missing bone from the glenoid side. It's technically more anatomic, if you like, because it's not you're not transferring anything from anywhere else. You're addressing glenoid bone loss. The problem is this is dead bit of bone that you're asking to heal to something that isn't particularly well vascularized. And if it doesn't heal, it resorbs. And that's a problem. Then you've got hardware, you've got metal screws that are prominent <coughs> in the shoulder. Um, and, but you can do this arthroscopy or open. You can do it with a variety of different auto or allografts. This is often described as an Eden Hebene procedure uh, named after the Swiss um, surgeon who described it. So just like we talked about with associated pathologies, there's also a surgical ladder for stabilization, <coughs> conservative management, arthroscopic bank cart repair plus or minus rempassage. An open bank cart repair, you could argue, although it's not very commonly done anymore, I would argue it's a very powerful way to stabilize the shoulder because it allows you to reattach the capsular labral tissue, but it also allows you to address capsular redundancy by uh, double breasting the, the um, capsulotomy that you make, okay? So most people will do a T-shaped capsulotomy and you can, you can bring the two leaves over each other and reduce that capsular redundancy. And there's bone block procedures, a Lagerge procedure, and then you can get into the weird and wonderfuls that aren't commonly done in this country, but they are in North America, which is a distal tibial allegra. If you get a dislocation case and there's someone who's over 40 years old, always, always think about the rotator cuff. Forget the labrum, that's not important in this age group as much as the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff will determine the outcome of the patient and also the rehab. So if you get someone um, who, who dislocates after the age of 40, just think about the rotator cuff and get some early imaging within two to three weeks to assess for a cuff tear. And if you do see it, you will see it in 35 to 86% based on the literature. Um, the cuff tear guides the management and rehab for that patient. You know. There's debate about whether you address the labrum at the same time as doing the cuff repair. A lot of surgeons don't bother because if you had a 40 year old who didn't have a cuff tear when they dislocated and just had a labral lesion like a bank heart lesion, the risk of recurrence at the age of 40 plus is very low. So you wouldn't ever offer them surgery. So a lot of surgeons are more than happy to ignore that and just treat the cuff uh, tear acutely. And I think that's right. Just one slide on posterior instability. It doesn't come up that much in itself, uh, other than one very specific scenario, which we'll come on to. It's very easy to miss. Uh, look for the subtle signs and the lack of passive external rotation. Posterior apprehension test is not as useful. You know, you got taught that in, in, in medical school and as SHOs, it's just not as useful for posterior instability. Um, but pain posteriorly, you know, there's very few things that patients describe pain at the back of their shoulder in their joint line. 
but one of them is often a posterior labral injury. And that's often worse if you get them in this position and to resist um, elevation, that makes it worse because they're basically trying to um, stabilize the glenohumeral joint and they don't know where the back is. So the dynamic stabilizers are firing, but they're not centering the, the, the humeral head. And so they, their pain often gets worse because they're pushing onto that posterior and um, capsular labrum. Um, and most do not require surgery unless they're quite high level athletes or um, feel very uh, unstable as well as painful. So the FRCS case that you tend to get, you get your bog standard traumatic anterior instability because there's lots of nuance, right? You can vary the age, the gender, whether they play contact sports, and you can have a discussion about all the associated pathologies. So that could come up. You don't tend to get the atraumatic or MDI, multidirectional instability, type 3 muscle pattern or type instability. That's probably a bit unfair to get that. You do quite commonly get fracture dislocations, so proximal human fracture, which we haven't really talked about, or um, displaced GT, fra GT fractures. And the one thing that I talked about earlier, which we'll come on to, is you do very commonly get the locked posterior dislocation, often in a slightly older patient. So let's go through the cases. Shall we actually just take a two minute break to take questions? Uh, Sean, do you have any questions at all there? Yes, sorry, there are a couple of questions. Um, the first question is actually um, from Said of as, uh, as far, sorry. Um, on track versus off track lesions, could you please re re explain that again? Uh, I haven't talked about that yet, but I will talk about that at the end. I've got some bonus slides. If you really want to learn about on track, off track, I, okay. you won't get asked it in the FRCS unless you're doing exceptionally well. I did get asked it in the EBOT exam, but then again, it's a shoulder surgeon asking me. And I'm a shoulder, you know, I'm a shoulder surgeon. So we got quite deep into that uh, case. But I will talk about on track, off track at the end of the talk, I promise, if we've got time. But I, I think yeah. the question for me in the FRCS, if you have a first time dislocator, would you, and you can't see any obvious uh, abnormality on the x ray, would you say you would go for a CT scan to look for a bony bone cart, or would you wait? Um, no, they all get cross-sectional imaging. So wherever that is of your choice, um, I would say the safe answer is probably an MRI first, okay? Because you will pick up a bony bank cart with an MRI a lot of the time. It's just quantifying the amount of bone loss is not as accurate with an MRI. Um, but the answer, the answer to that is they're seen in the uh, shoulder, upper limb trauma clinic within a couple of weeks. The advice is to discard the sling as soon as the pain subsides no restriction in mobilization, and they get cross-sectional imaging of wherever your preference is, most commonly in MRI, to look for the associated pathology. And if they're under 25, they get offered surgery if their clinical features are in keeping with their radiographic findings. Um, if they are over 25, um, you can try physiotherapy and reassess. And the risk factors for pushing more towards the, uh, surgical management after a first time dislocator are age, uh, gender, and um, contact sport. Thank you. Um, so in the exam, you would answer it in the way of younger patients, you're more likely to offer surgical. Um, the <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah, so I, I would just play it safe and just say, there are very good best guidelines on how to manage traumatic anterior instability. That's what I would follow, which involves clinical and radiological assessment via cross-sectional imaging in a specialist shoulder clinic uh, with uh, offering uh, arthroscopic soft tissue stabilization if that's the primary lesion in young people under 25, the first time it's located. That, that's, that's what the national recommendations are and that's what most people's practice is, to be honest with you. That gone are the days of Oh, you've had only one dislocation. Well, go away and come back when you've had your second and then we'll stabilize you. Those days are gone. The only time you do that is in slightly older patients or patients that aren't particularly active and just had a, a, you know, a freak traumatic event. Is that's why they're dislocated. Perfect. Perfect answer. Thank you very much. Um, if there's no other questions, we can move on. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think, Matt Wally, did you uh, ask about the radiographic signs or have you, have you, are you happy with that? I think 
I think we will come back to that. Um, so this is case one, 21 year old fit and active manual laborer who fell off a bicycle. He's now in the emergency department and he's got left shoulder pain. So this is quite common. Um, this is the clinical radiograph you may get uh, shown. This is just taken off Google. This is a very common picture. You see this a lot. Uh, just take your time and just say what you see, okay? Whenever you see, I'm not sure you can see my mouse here. Whenever you see this squaring off of the shoulder, just look at the opposite side. That's what your normal shoulder contour is meant to look like. The most lateral part of a normal shoulder is your humeral head, your great tuberosity and the deltoid muscle, okay? When you've dislocated anterior inferiorly, the most lateral part of your shoulder now becomes the lateral edge of the acromion. And that's very visible here. Yeah. So whenever you see that, it's almost certainly going to be um, an anterior dislocation. Okay. And so then you may go through your spiel of immediate assessment and get uh, radiographs to confirm. And you may get shown something like this. Don't get bogged down too much with this. This is an AP radiograph demonstrating a anterior dislocation of the glenohumeral joint with what looks like a hill sac lesion. I would then transfer the patient to the resource department, request immediate uh, procedural sedation and uh, safely uh, reduce the shoulder documenting neurovascular status before and after. Okay? And then confirming clinically and radiologically that it's enjoyed. Very simple, nothing too difficult about that. So the top tips for this kind of case, try to progress quickly through the A&E management. You really wanna to get to talking about um, the pathology on imaging and how you're gonna manage this patient in the clinic and the nuances of um, you know, age, gender, time of first dislocation, um, recurrence, all of that is where you really wanna to get to with this station as quickly as you can. The station can take many different routes, okay? It could start off the same way and you, your friends may get different questions. It may focus on how you reduce it in A&E. It doesn't really matter how you do it. You're just going to be able to describe how you do it and why, it's, and why you choose to do that and how you, how you go about doing it. It may talk about a nerve injury, either pre or post reduction, and how you're going to manage that. Again, keep it very simple. You're going to make an appropriate assessment. You're going to see them again in clinic, and um, you're going to look for degenerative nerve lesion um, and then refer onwards to a nerve specialist as per the BOSE guidelines without delay. Um, what happens when you fail to reduce it in A&E? That, that's could, where it could go. You know, you try, you try and try and try again. Your SHO tries, everyone tries, you can't get it in, what are you going to do? And it's all about how you progress to safely doing it. And if there's no vascular compromise, there is no immediate urgency, okay? Uh, and if you don't have the skills um, to address the scenario in its entirety, then it's okay to wait. But actually, at the FRCS, they do expect you to be able to do a delta pectoral approach and reduce a dislocated lock dislocation. Okay, so you can't wriggle out of it. You're going to have to talk about progressing to open reduction at some point. The only time where I would caveat that is if it's a fracture dislocation of an elderly four part fracture, where actually there's a reasonable chance the patient may require a reverse shoulder replacement as the definitive management of the first operation and you're not a shoulder surgeon, you may need to discuss that, but you may need to talk about the principles um, anyway. So you, can't, you still can't get out of talking about it, but you can at least mention that I, I would personally not do this because I'm not a shoulder specialist because there's a reasonable chance this patient may require a reverse, blah, blah, blah. But the principles are as follows. They may talk about the outpatient management in clinic, what kind of imaging, why, what lesions are you looking for, um, if it's someone who isn't a barn door arthroscopic bank heart repair type patient, um, how are you going to actually manage them? What's your pathway for physio? What are you going to ask the physio to work with? That's all kind of subtle and important things. Essentially, what you're looking for is restoration of range of motion, strength, and ensuring that they understand how to regain the normal proprioception in the context of a dislocation. So a lot of that's all about core stability. It's about scapular control. Um, we talked about that and then just refer back to the best guidelines they're there to help you and think of them like the BOSE guidelines you know 
There's no, if you talk about open fractures, you don't talk about the Bose guidelines, then you probably missed the boat there. Same with this. You got anterior traumatic, anterior instability of the shoulder. Just talk about the best guidelines. They're, they're there to help you. So case number two, 23 year old recreational rugby player had a second dislocation four weeks ago, reduced in the emergency department. The first dislocation occurred whilst playing rugby 18 months ago. He works in office, he's fit and healthy, he plays rugby every, every other weekend. And he's seen the outpatient department with feeling of instability when he abducts those cellular takes the classic at risk position, at risk position of your shoulder. You may get shown this. This is some rugby league player that I found on Google who had a dislocation. And they may, I don't think they will, but they could show you something, some form of imaging that is trying to point you towards the fact that they've lost the glenoid bone. So that could be the other type of scenario that you may get because <clears throat> you need to understand that you can't just do a labral repair in this context. It's highly likely it will fail. You've got a male contact athlete with glenoid bone loss. They're really pushing to talk about um, bone loss in the context of instability. You don't need to know too much about it other than that, if you've lost bone, put bone back, okay? <clears throat> so always look for bone loss, commonly on the humeral head, but also on the glenoid. There are some uh, axial cuts that they may show you on radiographs where you'll see quite obvious rounding off of the anterior glenoid. They may show you cross-sectional axials of CT scans. They may show you lots of different things, um, but just always comment on the glenoid if you, if you get imaging, just to see if there's a, a bank heart fracture there or just loss of glenoid bone, which often happens over time. Um, if it's unclear, get more imaging. MRI is probably the gold standard, um, but for bone loss, have a low threshold for CT. It's easier to get. It's more accurate for quantifying the percentage of bone loss. You've got to remember, you know, 20% bone loss is only really about five or six millimeters in the glenoid. There's small amounts, and, and we know that CT is more accurate for bone than MRI. If bone is lost, put bone back. And I would say the open latigé is probably the gold standard in this country. Don't start talking about bone block procedures unless they specifically ask you. The open latigé is something that you should be able to describe, to describe how it works, what the principles of it are, and the, uh, the anatomy of it. Um, look for pertinent risk factors and recurrence, okay? Bone loss, young male contact athlete. And finally, case number three, this is the classic case that you often will get. 77-year-old <clears throat> um, nursing home resident with dementia, complaining of pain for the last two weeks to their carers, history of falls, hypertension, TIA, reasonable quality of life, only really needs assistance with preparing food and shopping, and it ambulates independently. There's a couple of nuances here, right? The dementia, nursing home, uh, 77, okay, that's all relevant because what you really need to pick up in this kind of scenario is that the pain for the last two weeks is a red herring. This could have been dislocated for months, okay? And in fact, it has been dislocated for months until proven otherwise. So the way you fail the scenario is you start hiking on this little old lady's shoulder in A&E recess trying to reduce it. People often do. You will break her humerus if you do so. So it's a chronic locked posterior dislocation until proven otherwise, okay? This is the x-ray they may show you. You may say there's abnormal contouring of the proximal humeral head. It looks like a light bulb sign. I can see a hill sax lesion with a trough line sign and the glenoid fossa looks vacant. This is all in keeping with a possible locked posterior dislocation. I would like to get another radiographic view to confirm this. They don't have any, but they may show you, they won't show you videos, but they may show you a single axial slice of a CT. And you can see this is here, the articular surface of the humeral head. That's the LT, that's the GT. The bicipital groove is just here. And so this articular surface is meant to be here. And you can see this is a lock posterior dislocation. And you'll have to believe me when I say to you, there isn't a lot of sclerosis here. So this may be an acute. CT scan, this is not the same patient, this is some patient of radiopedia, but you can see there's not a lot of chronic changes here. So this may be more of an acute, but often what they'll show you is something with a lot more sclerosis, a lot of 
calcifications, osteophytes, degenerative changes in the fossa. These are all signs pointing towards a very chronic situation. If you're doing really well, they may ask you how you're going to manage this. And you need to basically talk about um, your assessment of how acute you think this is. If it is genuinely a few weeks and the CT scan does not show any chronic sclerotic changes to the, uh, um, to the joint surfaces, you may consider doing something called a modified McLaughlin or a McLaughlin procedure. So the McLaughlin procedure was described, um, oh, I forget his first name. Uh, I forget his first name, McLaughlin in like 1950 in the JBJS. And he basically just did a subscap medialization. It's basically what it was. He took the subscap off um, and then he, he put it into where that reverse hill sacs defect is. Okay. And it's basically like a replissage slash subscap transfer uh, to avoid that defect then um, falling back into the glenoid rim. A modified McLaughlin is where you take an LT osteotomy, so you take the lesser tuberosity with the subscap and you then medialize that into the reverse hill sax lesion. And you're basically filling in that impaction fracture by taking a vascularized graft, essentially, which is the subscap with the lesser tuberosity, and you're fitting it into that defect. So that's a modified McLaughlin. <clears throat> you can do other things. In a 77-year-old, um, if it's unstable after doing your modified McLaughlin, you may choose to take it down and do a reverse. Okay, A reverse is a very powerful way of bailing out of that scenario, but you don't want to be doing a reverse in a 50-year-old with this problem. So if they're 50, you're more likely to do a modified McLaughlin and try and stabilize it. If it doesn't stabilize after a modified McLaughlin, you may even choose to do um, a bone block, not at the same time necessarily, but that's really getting into level eight questioning there. But essentially, if they're younger, you're more likely to try and salvage the head. Unless it's incredibly chronic, yeah, then you're going to have to do a reverse. Assume chronic until proven otherwise, the top tip for this scenario. It's, it's really quite key. Bring out the nuance of decision making, explain your rationale. Okay. You, you, there's lots of different things you can do. The commonest is a modified McLaughlin. Um, you can do bone graft. If it's really acute, you can treat it like an acute fracture. You can elevate the fragment and fill some um, bone void filler behind it. If it's an older patient with chronic changes, just your bailout is a reverse. It's not uncommon in some patients like this to do nothing. <clears throat> just to do nothing. If they're super high risk for surgery and they're you know, they're, they've got a bit of aching, but not in agony all the time. And their risk for having a perioperative complication is really high. And you can leave them. You know, they'll get very poor function, but the pain usually subsides. So modifier McLaughlin, bone graft, reverse are the main options, really. The reverse is a safe option in those over 65, but it's not without risk. It's technically a very difficult reverse to do. And it's, it's not uncommon that that reverse will become unstable if it's not done correctly and tensioned properly. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> um, a, few, a few questions. Um, in oh, relation Tamar to asked me to remind everyone about the feedback. <laughs> I'd be grateful yeah. you could fill in the feedback form. But let's move on to questions for the timing. Um, Shwan, have you got any uh, from the yeah, chat? Yeah, so if you remember, there was, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, track. Oh, yeah, on track, off track. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, in terms of anesthesia uh, for reduction, um, would you consider local or intraarticular? It, it is described it is described you can also get a regional block and do a reduction that way we've done that at Rikinson a few times it, it's not a common thing so I don't, you don't start coming out with fringe answers in your FRCS stick with mainstream is my advice and the mainstream is um, appropriate sedation in the emergency department recess if that's not available or the patient's risk factors are too high get anesthetic support 
and get a general anesthetic and do it under muscle relaxation. So um, you sorry, this provokes in the exam from your examiner's raised eyebrows and uh, it's, yeah. it provokes, it wakes the bear, which is what you yeah. want to do. Um, let, let sleeping dogs lie. Don't, don't start saying things that, that um, you know, perks, that perks them up. Automatically, when someone says that to me, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Your anatomy is disrupted. How are you going to find your uh, place to uh, inject? Number one. Number two, what happens if that fails? Number three, um, what if uh, what local anesthetic are you going to use? I'm going to be really grilling into your local anesthetic. And we know that some, some papers have shown that there may be a risk with high levels of local anesthetic of cartilage damage. Um, mm. though, so then that brings up that question as well. So uh, I'm not saying uh, you shouldn't give local anesthetic into a joint like knee surgeons or doing arthroscopies often do, but you have to be aware that there are risks associated with what you're doing as well. Um, and the fact that you bring it up means you're going to be grilled really down to the minutiae in this topic straight away because it's unusual. And uh, it means you're provoking it. They're now wondering if you're a safe surgeon or not. Yeah, I agree. Um, the other question is about uh, how do you reduce a lock posterior dislocation? It's a delta pectoral approach. Um, it's often very difficult. You often have to have the patient fully relaxed. The anatomy is uh, distorted, obviously, on the way in. Um, the key really is be patient. Get a, um, a, a Homan uh, retractor in between the uh, humeral head and the glenoid and just walk it off uh, the glenoid. It can be very difficult to do. Um, if you have an anterior, a locked anterior dislocation, the commonest thing that people do is um, they struggle to fish the head out and they wrap their instruments around the brachial plexus because it's really not that far away. If that's if you're struggling to do that, uh, the safest thing is to take the coracoid down, and so you can make more space for yourself anteriorly. But a locked posterior dislocation is a delta pectoral approach. Don't go from the back. It's incredibly difficult. Um, there's another question from Saeed about how much bone loss is fixable. There's no right answer for this, but it, you know, if, if your lesser tuberosity is smaller than the bone loss that you've got, then, um, then you're in a bit of trouble. Okay. Then it'd be hard to stabilize, uh, that shoulder, um, in a, in a posterior bone loss, large reverse hill sacs context. In acute scenarios in young people, um, the Americans love allograft. And there are even these things called hemi caps that you can put in, which basically are um, metal caps that will fit onto the different size defects of the hill sacs. Again, not common UK practice. Don't start talking about that. It, if it's really acute, you can treat it like an impaction fracture, elevate it like you would a tibial plateau and bone graft it behind. And you can do that with or without taking down the subscap depending on if you can access it from the interval or not. You're not going to get asked that, to be honest with you. Um, and then I'm just going to talk briefly about some bonus uh, marks here. Can you still see my slides okay? Yeah. Uh, just a heads up, the bonus marks don't count if you don't get the basics right, guys. So 100%. 100%. It, it, you're not going to volunteer this, but if you get asked this, you pretty much pass the stage, Okay. So if the examiner asks you, would you ever consider an external rotation sling? What they're basically asking you is whether you know the evidence behind this. And so basically, A.J. Atoy is another one of these um, famous shoulder surgeons who came out with this paper uh, quite a long time ago now, nearly 20 years ago, um, where he had predominantly Japanese students who um, were, had a traumatic first-time anterior dislocation, and he put them in this contraption, which is a custom external rotation um, immobilizer and he basically found the rate of recurrence in his um, rct was lower in the er sling versus the standard sling in internal rotation and the idea is in external rotation the inferior um, uh, capsule uh, is slightly more taut and so it reduces the labrum closer to the footprint of the glenoid rim and therefore it may heal in that better position and be more stable the annoying thing about this even though this is fantastic, there are two other RCTs that came out from North America, I think, or I think maybe one was from Australia, that basically um, did not replicate his results. And when I asked about it, 
uh, Professor Itoi, and I've actually been to Japan to visit another shoulder surgeon out there. What was abundantly clear is they have no issue with compliance, right? If the surgeon says you need to be in an ER sling all the time, they will be in an ER sling all the time. And the other thing that he said to me, he goes, you got to remember most of my population were students. He works in the big university town. And he said, you know, most of the time they're at a desk. And so they're not manual laborers, or they're not going to discard their sling and get back to work straight away. And so um, just say in the exam, if you get asked about this, it's controversial. It's not commonly employed. Um, there was one study in Japan that suggested it's useful, but it hasn't ever been replicated. And so it's not something I would consider. And if you've ever tried to put anyone in the ER immobilizer yourself, they'll take it off within a week. The patients hate this more than anything else. All right. The next thing is about hill sacks. You may get asked, how do you measure a hill sack? Um, you could use this method, the circle method, and talk about um, the, the width of the hill sacks. But what they're really trying to get at, if you're really going for the eight and you've nailed everything else and they're asking you, do you know any other ways of quantifying whether a hill sack is relevant or not in the context of this dislocated shoulder? They're basically asking if you understand between this concept of the glenoid track. Now, the glenoid track basically came from, again, Professor Itoi with um, an Italian surgeon called uh, Giovanni Giacomo, Giacomo, I think his name is, um, where they basically looked at um, where the glenoid tracks on the humerus in the functional range of motion arc. So they put dion cadavers onto the glenoid and they then cycled them through a normal glenohumeral joint and then they tracked on the humerus where the glenoid uh, was articulated. They then created um, hill sacs lesions and um, bone loss on the glenoid side to try and determine this concept of the glenoid track. All you really need to know is there are two measurements that you make. They described it on CT. Um, John Tokish and Matt Provencher, I believe, have validated it for MRI. But what you basically need to measure is two measurements. One of them is called the hill sacs interval, which is the hill sacs defect plus the bony bridge up until the rotator cuff attachment, and that's a number. You then need to measure the glenoid track. Now, the glenoid track on the cadaver specimen was 83% of the maximum glenoid width. But when you've got bone loss, the maximum glenoid width is your perfect circle in the lower two thirds of your glenoid minus whatever glenoid bone you've got. That gives you your glenoid track. 83% of that is your total glenoid track. Now, the way I remember this, I got taught this by someone at the American Academy, which kind of makes sense, is if you're off track, think about, think about it like a Formula One race car. If you're off track, you've crashed, and you're likely to be unstable and therefore have to address the bone loss. Okay? And off track is bad. If you, you're off track, if your hill sacs interval is larger than your glenoid track. You're on track, which is good. Your race car is on the track. It hasn't crashed. And that's because your hill sacs interval is smaller than your glenoid track. Think of it like, I don't know, a really wide race car and a really small track. Yeah, if you're going around the bend, if your race car is wider than the, the tarmac, you might crash off the road. That's off track. If your race car is narrower than the width of the bend, you're going to remain on the tarmac and you're on track. And therefore, you don't need to address the bone loss. This has been validated um, as being a pretty good indicator of who fails following purely soft tissue surgery. Uh, you, if you get asked this in the FRCS for the station, you, you might be on for a gold medal, right? So don't worry too much about this thing. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the feedback from one of our mentors, he loves the concept of the race car off track. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody, once again. Um, this, uh, thank you, Mustafa, that was an excellent talk. Um, really uh, well laid out and comprehensive and ma made it really easy for everyone to understand.